Hello and welcome to the Rock on Tours podcast. I am Gary Kemp. And I am Guy Pratt. This week on the show, we are talking to one of the greatest British rock and roll stars. Lead singer of Deep Purple, founder of Whitesnake, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee and man whose name is synonymous with feel-good rock and roll. Another guest whose career in music deserves an entire series. Please welcome David Coverdale. Ha <laughs> ha, darlings. Okay, you know what? I need me fucking reading glasses here. I can't see you. Oh, good. I can wear mine. <laughs> you can't wear yours. <laughs> Where are, yeah, where, Jesus. where are you, David? I'm in uh, the beautiful, sleepy foothills of uh, the Sierra Nevadas at our studio, where my wife and I have had to uh, decamp. We almost lost the house two months ago. Is it, Michael? In a fire. Oh, no. Oh, wow. Fucking, you know, oh, yeah, really, really bad. Not the house that you remember, Guy. By the way, Cindy sends love, and you still <laughs> yeah. haven't paid your mini bar bill. <laughs> 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 the, uh... I can believe it. <laughs> but that house... We've, we've had on the market for like 10 fucking years. But no, that why at, you're doing um, this in, bought... that's why you're doing this interview, David. Is, is this another way of sort of being a Rialto? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah it's, it's the closest thing to getting on tour. <laughs> I know you through Guy, I, uh, and you guys have been friends for yeah. quite some time, and and it's very nice to see you don't... You look much nicer than he described. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I, think, I think we should start with how you two know each other. How do you two know each other? It was fascinating because we tried a couple of bass players for Jimmy Page and David Coverdale, the Coverdale Page Project, and nobody was working. Who brought you into the mix there, Guido? Do you know what? This is a, a, an incredible connection. It was Lionel, who was Jimmy's tech, who was also Gary's guitar <gasps> tech. Yeah. That was Lionel. Oh, and it was kick ass. No, no, that was great because it just it was immediate uh, connection. Yeah. You and Denny Kamasi, one of my favorite oh. rhythm sections. Yeah, a guy you. at the time, I think, was working with uh, Pink Floyd well, I went with for years. because of yes. nefarious connections, I believe. And then after that, I invited Guy to do an album with me, which was supposed to be a David Coverdale solo record called Restless Heart. But he was amazing. But uh, the thing was, Reno's never been the fucking same, Gary. The, uh, he came up to me and he says, oh, David, I'll cut you like John Lee Missouri, as you know. Oh, David, uh, rubbing his fucking temples. Uh, oh, uh, if you, I'll cut you a deal if you let me go home early. I'm going to fucking kill myself if I stay here. <laughs> I don't remember Can it you... like that. It was the happiest month. I do remember having the most fantastic Yo, uh, month. We were, one week we were the bloody gloves. What were we? <laughs> anal leakage. Uh, the uh, anal leakage. Uh, was an, uh, right. By the way, you're going to be, you can be able to add to your CV that I'm going to make that Restless Heart an actual White Snake album. Totally. Uh, we've totally. been remixing everything, as I told you, when we were uh, direct messaging. So, yeah, add that oh. to your immense portfolio. And I'm, I've got to tell you, I would fucking love to see Saucer Full of Secrets because I'm a major early fan. Floyd, oh, yeah. major early Floyd fan. In fact, as I was walking through the fucking living room to come in here, Arn <laughs> Lane came on. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> but Yeah, but I, uh, I'm so... It's so... Whoop! <laughs> oh, he's gone. He's dropped something. No, there he is. I'm trying to knock Guy Pratt some sense into him. <laughs> um... <laughs> You know, it's heartbreaking enough, guys, as, as you know, as performers, yeah. to, to have to cancel a gig. But to cancel a fucking sold-out world tour is devastating. So it's what, what, utterly devastating. What were, you, what were you about to do? What would you have done this year? If, uh, would you have gone on the road? We actually did some work. We started off in Australia, supposed to go to New Zealand, and then uh, issues happened. So we ended up finishing off in Jakarta, Indonesia, uh, and then Singapore before the shit really hit the fan. And then we were in for a sold-out uh, Japanese tour. And then really literally 36 hours before, pretty much all the states, counties or what have you, closed down. So we were all prepared to go in guns blazing, but the Japanese promoters closed us down. So we came home early, still with a plan of going into the UK. First time I was going to do the O2, oh. you know, sold out, kick ass and yeah. really exciting. Uh, David, what have you been doing then in this time? Have you been making music in the studio at all? Or have you yeah, writing? Yeah, well, yeah. 
yeah, been writing definitely. It's a curse, as it were. I was always written since I was a kid. Started with poetry, then I learned a few chords, became songs, you know. This was entirely unexpected. But Michael and I have been working now for the last couple of years on remixing, revitalizing, remastering the catalog that I actually own of Whitesnake. And... Um, we're way ahead of the curve right now. I mean, this I was talking to the manager of an extremely well-known band the other day. It's their 50th anniversary, and they don't have shit. They had a world tour, big buck tour out there, and, of course, they have nothing in reserve to put out, and we already had this Red, White, and Blues trilogy. The first box set next year, Guy, will be Restless Heart. I'll make sure Yay. you get it. Right, thank you. Uh, just the one, just the one, yeah, of course. Absolutely. They're, no, they're of expensive. Course, of course. The, uh, but, honest to God, your playing is Fabulous. Your playing is absolutely fabulous. We've been remixing, repackaging, and actually working on... Uh, when Michael and I sat down and said, you know, how the hell can we keep a focus, keep other than social media? So we've been working for the last couple of months on, uh, on a radio show which is pretty happening, actually, because I get to play music that inspired me, influenced me, and talk to people. You know, Paul Stanley and I spoke about, from Kiss, spoke about 60s Motown, and, you know, we're still working on it. And then, of course, the wildfire a couple of months ago threw everything. You know, it's not as, as if we're not dealing with enough, yeah. you know, with yeah. this global mm. pandemic. But, my God, the universe is throwing all kinds of shit and see what sticks. It's extraordinary. And the house is okay. You've got your political stuff. We have our political... Yeah, but all of the landscaping gone. Oh. It's honest to God, it's like fucking Wuthering Heights up there. I can't wait for it to snow to get rid of the black. But you are very like you Heathcliff, know. let's face it, David. So. <laughs> oh, yes, darling, yes. Yes, 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 I'd, I'd say so, yes. <laughs> David, so can we lean on for that? Because you were talking about your influences. Because that was, you were very much, you were very much an R&B soul guy, weren't you, when you came into Deep Purple? yes. When I joined Purple, my most three most played albums was There's a Riot Going On, Sly and the Family Stone, Donny Hathaway Live, oh. uh, and Music music of My Mind, Stevie Wonder. Those were my wow. three, you know. Yeah. And uh, it's Im impossible to imagine. In two years' time, it's 50 years since I started as a recording artist. It's with Deep Purple. Yeah. It's extraordinary, yeah. you know. And I was hoping to be touring now because I just turned 69. I'd even Designed the fucking T-shirts. I bet you are. You know, it was, yeah, it was perfect. The best, the best fucking year for the singer for, for from yeah. Wasting to retire. Come on, uh, Jesus. Get, so, David. I just want to get some focus on you beginning because you ended up with this unbelievable voice. You're a soul kid. Where did you grow up? Yorkshire, right? Where Where are you? So, yeah, Yorkshire, mate. Yorkshire, northeast, uh, industrial northeast. Only relatively recently, I found out that my first five years were I spent predominantly with my maternal grandma, my nana, who had two teenage kids, uh, my auntie Sylvia, uncle Eddie. When I was six, or so, I think it was six. Of course, in those days, all her pocket money, Sylvia's pocket money, would go on. Uh, vinyl singles or and and the first thing I remember just chilling me to the marrow and I have no idea why was Elvis Presley's Jailhouse Rock yeah and I mean I even utilized the structure of that for one of my biggest rock songs a song called Still of the Night which Guy played with me and uh, covered El Page it's a killer riff and then Little Richard oh my god he blew the doors off for me but you can imagine it was still uh, difficult for me to understand as a wacky because the stuff that we was hearing growing up was you know very Lily White Herman's Hermits, Mrs. Brown, you've got a lovely daughter, and no milk today, for Christ's sake. You know, <laughs> you couldn't have less sex if you paid for it, you know? And the Beatles uh, and the so, Stones? How did the Beatles and the Stones feed into Well, you? it was more the Stones, pretty things, Yardbirds. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I had to, when I was working with Pagey, I told him I'd had a really bad drawing of him in the, on the Yardbirds on my school haversack. And he went, I'd rather you didn't say that, David. <laughs> Should we maybe have done some Yardbirds? In the Covered L Page thing. I can't remember if we did... Um, there's a song I wrote, which Jimmy initially didn't recognise, on the album called Whisper a Prayer for the Dying, oh, yeah. and I used the For Your Love chords for... Da -da -do, da -da -do, da -da -do, da -da just in a different structure. And I'd see these different names, like Slim Harpo, Billy Boy Arlen, uh, Morgan Morganfield, or Muddy Waters. So that led me to discovering blues artists, uh, which was a huge formative experience for me, hearing people sing about physical and emotional 
experience yeah. with no holds barred. And for some reason, in a repressed Catholic and Protestant home, that was uh, extraordinary. Hearing Ray Charles sing yesterday, how beautiful McCartney sings it, but the entire different emotional depth that Ray Charles pulled out of that song, Otis Redding, all of these things I aspired to be a black guy. <laughs> and, 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 and you couldn't have been in a whiter band. <laughs> when did you find that voice? When did you start to sing? Were you forming bands as a, as a kid? And so, I mean, that particular high voice that you have. Yeah. Well, before I was bastardized with cigarettes and alcohol, I had a very, very high choir-like voice. And I'd been showing off to some girls at school at 14 or 15 after doing some kind of school concert. And one girl said, oh, I'll tell my brother they've got a band. They're looking for a singer, which, of course, immediately involuntary bowel movement. You know, I was being called on my shit. Uh, <laughs> so that night, my mother comes in and goes, uh, there's four lads downstairs want to see you. I thought I was in for a good hiding. You know? <laughs> and uh, so we go over. I'm nervous to death. And everything was in this tiny bedroom, including a drum kit. I sang through a Dynatron Cordova uh, or, or a 12 watt wham amp that the bass player was playing through. Dominator. So nobody could uh, learn a song from a record at that time. So they had to steal sheet music from, <laughs> from Middlesbrough, from a music shop called Hamilton's, and uh, stick it under the jacket and sneak out, uh, you know. So they started to play, I think, Give Me Some Love. And I think it was in D. And with absolutely no blinkers on, I started to sing and go, Oh, I have to go higher. And they just stopped amazed. Uh, I'd never sung anything like that myself before, but I sounded like, you know, with using the diaphragm to get up there, yeah. I sounded like fucking Steve Winwood, for Christ's sake, you know, yeah. uh, who was only, at that time, only a few years older than me. Can you imagine writing Give Me Some Loving at 16 oh, or yeah. fucking 17? Yeah. Jesus. But um, so that was the beginning. And then the more music I learned, the more I'd see great singers in the area a guy called Terry Reed, who oh, Jimmy yeah, 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 out to be yeah. the very first singer for, for Zeppelin. And his dad wouldn't let him. They're not the best produced records, but Jesus, I would see Terry Reed Fantasia up in uh, Red Car, Saltburn, you know, all of these little uh, Red Car Jazz Club and stuff like that. And it was a lovely little guy, very Mark Bolan like beautiful, but with it, really super lungs, totally super Steve lungs. Steve Marriott must have been on your radar as well. Oh, my God. Oh, completely and utterly. The Small Face was, was one of my, you know, harnessing rock and soul. It was just such a big fucking deal for me. And throw in the blues and you got it. 60s soul for me. Whenever I'm coming up to write, it's usually I'm playing 60s Motown, Stax Vault. These things just so inspire me. You know, the Motown stuff particularly. Perfect musicianship, perfect arranging, astonishing vocals, pertinent lyrics. You know, they're just perfect records. See, just going back to Humble Fuck. Hi, you, know. you played with Clem Clempton as well, didn't you, later on? Oh, John Lord, God bless him. God totally, rest his soul. Totally. Uh, he brought Clem over and had more or less told him over a, a, a long-ass LA, London, LA flight that he was pretty much in. And as good as he was, it, it, was, uh, it, it was definitely not somebody who needed to be the lead feature in Deep Purple. First name on my list was Jeff Beck, uh, which... I'm still like the biggest fan. He never rests. He's always yeah. pushing the envelope. Uh, next was Rory Gallagher. Oh, God yeah. bless his heart. Live I, in I, Europe I thought he would have been a great fit. Also, it would have been great for me to write power blues with him, you know. Uh, and the third was a guy called Tommy Bolin, uh, who had only heard on Billy Cobham's Spectrum mm -hmm. uh, and a, a drummer called Alphonse Mouzon's Mind Transplant. I didn't know if he was a 60-year-old African-American session guy or whatever. Not the multicolored fingernailed, you know, multicolored head, hip guy that he was, you know. And sadly, his love affair with uh, illegal substances uh, got the better of him, which was heartbreaking because he was an immensely talented kid. Mm -hmm. But he walked into Pirate Sound, uh, which is what SIR now in L.A., and he just, we had this wall of amps, and he just walked in. He'd actually, we found 
found out later he'd had to go to the pawn shop to get his strat out. You know, he just walked in, plugged in, and just walked down, turning everything to max, hit whatever fucking chord it was, and uh, Ian Pace threw his fucking Los Angeles Times down and jumped up, and we started jamming. Wow. That was what we needed, wow. you know, for... Like having Townsend come in, it was like, fuck! You know, immediate electricity. We're jumping, you know? we're jumping ahead slightly, but that period yeah, yeah. of what you were doing with... Cause I think you're t- you're talking about that album. Um, uh, come taste the come band. Taste the band. Hey, <clears throat> yeah. there's, there's such a... That came out of that came out of cabaret, being drunk and right. singing the wrong there's words. Such a... <laughs> there's, there's extraordinarily, you're making a kind of funk album, and who would have? Yeah, yeah. You know, this is this is an album that sounds almost like the '80s in 1976 or whatever it was. You know, '75. We can't touch them, sadly, Glenn and I. Uh, we brought soul and funk into the Purple wanted a, a redecoration. At, back in the 70s they'd done amazingly well and it was a beautiful you know band uh, but they wanted a change particularly Richie so Glenn came in with soul rock and I came in with soul rock and blues but we both Glenn Hughes and I loved funk you know all of that early yep. um, Hollywood swinging. You know Ohio players, uh, Cool and the Gang, Chaka Khan and Rufus. You know all these things. But Sly, dear God, you know, and Willie Weeks on uh, Donny Hathaway Live, unbeatable stuff. You know Andy Newmark. So that was something that that Richie wasn't prepared to go for. We did a, most of the writing together for the first Burn and the Stormbringer album, uh, and he came to me on. Stormbringer with a riff uh, which had been inspired from one of the band of gypsies, Hendrix's band of gypsies, things called Changes. Mm -hmm. And the vibe, the entire vibe I got from that was very much a Stevie Wonder thing. You know, he wanted that uh, punchy Buddy Miles kind of percussive vocal. And I felt as, uh, have you ever thought of the feeling? You know, and uh, the song was called You Can't Do It Right With The One You Love. Mm -hmm. Uh, nothing you can do without the one you love. Total fucking soul. So ultimately, Richie wanted out, right. you know. But we wanted to harness he needed to that get... rock stuff, and Tommy was Tommy was great for that. Tommy Bowling. Richie wanted to go off and find a medieval hat to wear, didn't he? <laughs> well, it's no. It's, I'm very happy after the dreadful uh, loss of John Lord in 2012. I realised that we were all coming into an age set where. John had called me and said, you know, Davey, I've got this, you know, scenario, but I'm going to kick it. And uh, would you do something purple related with me? I said, Johnny, I'll do anything mm-hmm. for you. And as we know, uh, that, that was an evil, evil cancer. Yeah. But what I did was start to reconnect with people I'd lost contact with privately and professionally to bury any imaginary hatchets or just to say, how are you doing? Just know I love you. Thank you for being instrumental in my life you know, uh, mentors from my childhood. uh, uh, And I I sat there and I thought, Christ, Richie and I had an amazing connection when I came in. Him and John were like... Uh, the best professors at the University of Deep Purple mm-hmm. that I could ever have imagined. John's fabulous uh, bon vivant, mm-hmm. you know, beautiful stories and fabulous uh, musicianship. Richie's amazing focus on, you know, what a band, what an audience wants. It was great to learn from both of them. I still utilize a lot of the lessons I learned, but I felt after 30 years of digs unnecessary, because initially there was a competition between White Snake and Rainbow, and then, of course, in the 80s, when Whitesnake just went through, blew through any glass ceiling, whatever, there was nothing to compete with. So the circumstance for me was, Christ, I owe him a thank you before anything else happens, you know? And we reconnected, and it was lovely. So, And we're still in touch, which was really was nice. That on, was that on the Purple album? Well, I did. I did the Purple album. This was related to John. I started. I don't really. Uh, I learned from the past as opposed to living it, but it got me listening to 
those albums again. And I was going, wow, and this is, don't forget, I got the job for my 21st birthday. Uh, and, and Richie and I had to basically write this album with the amazing uh, identity that Ian Pace is drumming, that Glenn Hughes is astonishing bass playing and singing. John Lord's remarkable, which his left hand, if you'll excuse the expression, was very responsible for their identity. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Blackmore, who was like, like Jimi Hendrix to me, mm-hmm. you know, Hendrix, I never met Hendrix, unfortunately, but he's like my muse. He harnessed it all for me. I was this disciple to his uh, sage, as it were, Richie's, but I couldn't leave with him when he went. He, he asked me to go with him and I just I had a loyalty to, to John and Ian and Glenn, you know. But oh, just, just go, go back a little bit because... You're yeah, 20, 20 years old. You're in a band what called the Government, <laughs> and, and there's this massive band over here that are that are making. Well, yeah, but I know, didn't know that. Huge it was a, records. I knew they were. And I then, knew they were big in the UK. I'd seen them on top of the fucking pops. I actually, I'd actually seen them at Red Car Jazz Club. Your second gig Amazing. or something. I don't know where it was. It was Madison Square Garden. Well, it was the California jam. Yeah, I slept I slipped into the oh mother when I saw <laughs> the audience. There was they had two or three PAs and you got when the audience responded, you got waves of this. I'd never I'd played working men's pubs in the north of England. That was it. You know, but that was I swear to God, that was a lot harder than playing Madison Square Garden. How, how did you get the gig? How did you end up in Deep Purple? I mean, they've got one of the most established rock singers. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, well, I I was a big fan of In Rock. I thought it was a great record, and actually, very early stuff uh, like Emeretta, uh, Ring That Neck. I thought was really cool. I had that single, but. Allman Brothers was huge to me. That's ah. a huge part of the blueprint of uh, of Whitesnake. That for, they harnessed oh. all of the things, symphonic arrangements, you know, slide playing. If you look at the the birth of Whitesnake, you have Mickey Moody on slide, Bernie Marsden on Dicky Betts style guitar, John Lord, Greg Allman. You know, I just took the Greg Allman part. But that was when uh, that first album with these unique takes on amazing blues songs. These absolutely glorious records that were perfect to me. Those were my, like, Sgt. Pepper albums. And that was really what I, I envisioned, you know, for Whitesnake to be. But joining Purple, they were remarkably protective of me. And I just looked to left and right. When I'd, we'd eat at the George Sanctum, there was like 13 knives and forks on either <laughs> side of me. And I was used to, well, and only, you know, a table with a bottle of tomato sauce on, mismatched cutlery and and, you know, uh, whatever they could <laughs> scrape together. What, Four, what, two up, two down, outside toilet. Sweet at the Georges Sank was like something else for me. Well, I mean, I've never gotten over it. So you got a tape to the... Well, you were in that band, The Government, right? It was very funny. When I joined Purple, I was actually with a, a band of local fabulous players called the Fabulosa Brothers that had come together to do some charity work for Leonard Cheshire Holmes. So the night I auditioned for Deep Purple, the percussionist has never forgiven me. We were supposed to open for the average white band in Red Car, <laughs> and, of course, they had to cancel it because I was auditioning for Purple. And he went, I was so looking forward to blowing them off. <laughs> 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 Never forgiven me. Fifty years later. <laughs> but, but what I'm impressed by, I have to say, David, the size of your balls. Because you walk into this big established band, you start, you start saying, right, I think we should change the music. I've got an idea for another guitar player. You make that band your band. I mean, that's well, quite astonishing. Uh- Actually, when John and Ian uh, joined me in Whitesnake, it looked like I had some kind of master plan, which really wasn't as much as I loved them. Yeah, they came to... They asked me to join uh, PAL. Remember them guy, Pace Ashton Lord? Tony Ashton, you must know. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Another God rest his soul. Tony knew everybody, and I met him when I knew George Harrison, bless him. But yeah, Tony Tony was great. You would have loved him, guy. Totally your sense of humour. I met him. Nothing. I met him at the Hell Blues festival when i was playing with gary oh, Moore. oh it, that's right live, it, live from hell live, yeah there was, I, I loved it. I, there was a it's in sweden it's a blues festival called the hell blues festival. yeah yeah no it's and, norway in it isn't norway, it yeah. isn't in norway my joke was no. i always thought hell would be a blues festival <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Oh, that's so good. So good. But you, let me ask you, what have you, uh, I know I saw you and your brother fabulous in the Cray Brothers. I thought that was a beautiful uh, uh, performance you. of the pair of you. Yeah, it's kick ass. So have you been involved with continuing from Spandau? Because the other Gary, uh, he gave my wife a, a recipe for, so, so he's Gary? in the good books, the singer. Not Tony. Tony, Tony. Tony. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, he no, gave her a recipe we, um... for a book called Food That Rocks. We've gone the way of a lot of bands, and we're, we are estranged, to say the least, at the moment. Oh, uh, oh really? Yeah. I have a, a Rolodex full. <laughs> <laughs> and we are... Um, so I spent the last two years with, with Source Full of Secrets and uh, and making my own music as well in this lockdown period, as it were, and doing this... this yeah. All trying to keep busy, really. You know what it's like. It's, uh, yeah. It's been a... It's Before, been, instead of you going mad. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it's a time when... You, I was so impressed by McCartney, just suddenly, you know, here he is. You know, he could have... He doesn't need to do it, but he, he writes an album and decides to put it out in this lockdown. It's necessary. It's obviously necessary. It was To some people, music's a job. You know, to others, it's a calling. You know, I can uh, relate to Indian philosophy of commune with the instrument before you take on the affairs of the day. And I have an incredibly fucking overactive muse. I can't pick up an instrument or sit at the piano without something tickling in. So I can fully understand that. I can fully understand. I've really enjoyed uh, Bruce Springsteen's recent yeah. album too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, this. Uh, if people can accept the, the aging, God willing, artistically, gracefully, you know, I can't sing Still of the Night the same as I did in 87. You know, it's tuned down a tone. You need just unbelievably tight underpants for this shit, you know? <laughs> Um, I, I, but let's let's so, just let's go back to what we've yeah. not got to, believe it or not. <laughs> You'd think we were at the height of your career, the way we've been talking, because you're playing in front of two hundred thousand people, blah blah blah. But you're still not at the height of your career. You're still not in White Snake. No, and yeah, you're going yeah, yeah. about to write some of the most famous songs ever written. I mean, what yeah, made you yeah. suddenly think, you know what? I've had enough with Purple. I want my own thing now. Well, it was drugs. Easy. I turned around. I didn't want to do the, the final UK tour because the band was just falling apart. And, and both John and Ian, Ian Pace, the drums, and, and John Lord were playing with their heads down, you know. And they, these are proud fucking people with a proud heritage. And, and I couldn't be part of that. I couldn't be part of the demise. I did the final tour to accommodate a friend of mine who was no longer a friend and bitterly regretted doing it. I thought it was a... Uh, uh, I could, I, when I was playing Liverpool Empire, looking down and seeing f hardcore fans looking up going uh, uh, inarticulate with what the fuck was being performed in front of them and how it was being performed. The moment I left the stage, I had the driver take me to my mother's place. Uh, I'd got to a little pub in a place called Hutton Rugby in New York, Yorkshire. I was so fucked up, exhausted, completely and utterly wiped out. And it took me nine days to write my resignation letter. I took it down to the office at 25 Newman Street, presented it to the, and uh, they said, do me a favor, don't say anything. Let's ask John and Ian what they want to do. I said, sure. And I flew off to Munich where I resided for the next couple of years. Wow. It was an easy decision. Uh, nobody could understand, of course, after such this glorious Cinderella story, rags to riches or whatever, which pretty much it was. But I think it was also encouraging for people that these things do actually fucking happen. You didn't have to go on Huey Green's Opportunity Knox to get, you know, uh, you know, the audition tape I sent in. I was rat assed on it. <laughs> Ian Pace was the one who picked mine up and he called Richie and he said, well, I think we've got the kind of tone we're looking for, but he's also drunk, you know. Which, which I was because we'd gone to 10CC Studio, Strawberry Studios yeah. in Stockport to do some demos in a local band and we would take this hardcore cider and uh, asthma and bronchitis pills called Dodos. Yeah, oh God, we, we, we used to take those. We'd always get... We'd, we'd, I remember in clubbing days, we'd, we'd get someone car, to... Pull a pint of cider with barrel shit now, you know. We'd always get someone but to the, go I in the chemist to the, and cough. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. I could. But no, so I said to the engineer, there's this microphone hanging from the ceiling, you know, fixed. And I went, do you have a, a hand mic I could use? And he goes, no, no, why? There's your microphone. I'm going, no, no, you know, I'm used to singing with a mic. You know, I'd use the mic stand as a crutch to, to get up to some of these big notes. Uh, and he goes, no, if you can't sing, you can't sing. 
oh my god, straight to the spare guitar case and the dodos and the fucking uh, <laughs> cider and wailed as, as best as I could in this uncomfortable, unfriendly environment. I don't know how many fucking engineers have ruined people's careers by saying, you know, if you yeah. can't do this or you can't. Remember Clapton, this astonishing John Mayles Blues Breakers album, the Beano album, the Beano as one, it's yeah. known. You know, he had a 25-watt twin reverb fender, a Les Paul. You know, if you listen to him in the Yardbirds beforehand, it's great guitar playing. I think he's doing a Telecaster, but it's relatively light. And the guys who were engineering that album Clapton starts playing and they rip the fucking earphones off and go oh my god you can't play that loud you can't play that loud. so Clapton's packing his stuff up to go and John Mayo's sweet talked him slipping some money and let him record this astonishing wow. record which stands out today and that changed my life and changed all the guitar players in the north of England who who embraced that stuff that was just immense record to get that sound oh my god and just this, breathtaking so david does this tape still yeah. exist yeah. You know what? I don't know. The only thing I got back was a picture of me as a Boy Scout with really badly stained shorts. The purple management insisted on a photograph, and I didn't have any. You know, so I had this drunken tape and a picture of me, and I opened up with "Do you deep purple?" As you can see, I'm always prepared. <laughs> Oh, and Ian Pace said, and I think he's got a sense of humour. <laughs> David, what was your vision for White Snake? Because it was really you and lots of different players come in for each album. It was it was it you and a band of was it session players? How did it? How no, did you see no, it? No, that's how it unfolded, Gary. It's uh, that was really Ian Pay said to me one time. Nobody, you can't expect us. That was you can't expect us all to be live rock and roll twenty four seven. Uh, and I was kind of unaware that I was living rock and roll 24-7 and with the, you know, the partying aspect. But it made me think, you know, if somebody shares a particular vision with me, which is Whitesnake, I always invite musicians to participate who I feel can learn from the experience, but can also contribute to expanding Whitesnake to you know, another rung on the ladder or something. I've always encouraged, hopefully uh, with Guy too, encourage musicians to spread their wings. If they shit in the nest, however, <laughs> that's the party's over. So what, was, what, was, the, what was the big moment? And it, was it with Bernie when you wrote together? No, the, actually the first thing was uh, my local hero was a guitar player called Mickey Moody. Uh, yeah. um, he was in like the big local band who actually made a couple of albums. They were called Tramline. They made a couple of albums on... Um, Island and Mickey was playing like a Jeff Beck style Telecaster with a Gibson pickup and it was I thought he was just the tits so we actually stayed in touch as I was getting more disenchanted with the purple thing and there was nobody really backing the Coverdale horse or the Glenn Hughes horse in the management they were just focusing on on John and Ian so I was given 10 grand to put an album together and an old mate, uh, Roger Glover, who's still a member of Deep Purple, agreed to produce it with me, he loved the songs, and I wrote some of the songs for Mickey Moody. So Mickey Moody was like the first member of what became Whitesnake, and then I had a chance meeting at a Frankie Miller concert at the Rainbow with Bernie, because Pace Ashton Lord had collapsed, uh, and he's a good little hustler, is Bernie, you know. I said, well, I've, I've got a good guitarist, I'm fine. He said, oh, well, I'll just come down, I'll just come down. And he played terrific and a great voice, and it was a great nucleus to start with, you know. A Fool for Your Loving, and the first significant hit we had was for B.B. Uh, King when he was with the Crusaders. And then I was sitting with Martin Bird, what? God rest his soul. Hang on a minute, so someone covered your record B.B. King covered your record first. No, 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 no. Uh, Bernie Marsden had done an interview for Sounds as a young white blues guitar player interviewing one of the legends, you know, one of the kings, uh, no pun intended. And B.B. had said, yeah, why don't you guys write a song for me? And at that time, he was working with the Crusaders with Pops Blackwell on uh, on bass, you know. Ah. So if you lighten up, if you lighten up the idea of... Uh, those minor high minor chords that BB would excel at. That was the whole structure. But, you know, of course, we put our... And Martin and I looked at each other and went, 
I think we should hang on to this. <laughs> So ultimately, we I never see. we never sent it on, but that was the original inspiration Got it. Uh, for for it was for BB. And here I go again as well, which was, was the other one. You, I think that just got a bigger award. I think Bernie. You you got an award for I that? Think, didn't yeah, you? I think yeah, I think so. He never he never fucking tells me. <laughs> I think you just got seven million seven million airplays in something a, in the like USA. that. Yeah, he, he he keeps that to himself. He never tells me. I just get on with my thing. It's a very very big song, very successful song, and I wrote it about the breakdown of my first marriage in, in the Algarve. It was so funny. I was watching the Grand Prix last week in uh, with Lewis Hamilton joining the ranks of the immortals, and uh, and I said to my wife that. That's where I wrote Crying in the Rain and uh, and Here I Go Again because my wife at the time, the mother of my beautiful baroness daughter, we weren't friends anymore and separate bedrooms and all that kind of stuff. And Here I Go Again, which is now this big rock anthem around the world, was actually about the breakup of, uh, of the, my first marriage. Oh, wow. Well. Uh, but it is an anthem yeah, for, so. for standing up, isn't it? And sort of moving up. Yeah, as... yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's a big, big tune. I mean, a guy worked with me, uh, with Pagey, with who I'll be... I'll say, have you, are you still in touch with him, Guido? Uh, Pagey, no. Not, no, I, I spoke to him a few weeks ago. I've got some super-duper fucking news for him. I love we've maintained a beautiful friendship and supportive uh, and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so he came out, Guido. I mean, we were jamming before Jimmy came. Came in on Dixie Chicken, and uh, remember we'd be jamming yeah, with yeah, Denny yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, I love Denny. You know, Sammy Hagar's first band was called Montrose. Uh, Montrose, yeah, that- uh, yeah, and that was Denny was in there, right. a super guy, super drummer, and these two were just rock and Rolex. I swear to God, it was a marriage made in heaven for yeah, us. Thank you. Pagey loved Denny because it was just so on and uncluttered. You know, he's a very very meat and potato solid, very bonzo. So you. Can build all kinds of shit around it, and 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 still have a drive. He has a great. Huh? Th- he has this great thing of turning the beat around, playing it backwards. Yeah, which yeah, amazing. yeah. Well, he loved. Remember Pagey coming in on the last day of rehearsal? He goes, "David, David, David, we've got to talk." Uh, well, what is it, Jimmy? We had this little office on the side of the rehearsal thing. We haven't done stairway. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? We were like three months in, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. I remember oh, and it's that. the last day, and we haven't done fucking stairway. And I went, "Oh, oh don't worry about it." You know. Goes, oh, be it on your own head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The last thing I did with Jimmy was I actually did the Olympic song with him. When we did, we cut a whole lot of oh. love. We did a whole lot of love, but we oh. did it in Studio Two at Olympic with the original amps. It was amazing. Whoa. Are you shitting me? I yeah. saw that. That's so cool. The band comes up to me because evidently I'm more approachable than the Pope of fucking rock, you know, <laughs> and said, Do us, David, 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 you've got to talk to Jimmy. We can't play Kashmir any fucking more. <laughs> 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 Do you remember, guy? It's like he's driving us fucking mad. We can't sleep. So Jimmy goes, oh, OK, I get it. We'll move on to something else. <laughs> and then I said, OK, lads, you've got it. And they're all fucking, oh, thank God. So what do they do? Every one of them makes fucking mistakes all through it. And Jimmy comes over and goes, I told you. <laughs> In the eighties, there were there seemed to be like these two big tribes. So there's there's the bands like what we were doing and Duran and Frankie to a certain extent and Culture Club. And then on the other side, there's your sort of Iron Maiden and, and Def yeah. Leppard and White Snake. But I think there's a record that somehow all of us, not you, because you did it, but all of us wanted to make, and 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 that mm. was "Is This Love?" Because "Is This Love" has uh. just got the most perfect '80s production sound ever. And I remember hearing that on FM radio, sitting in a car in America, mm. thinking, "That's the record I want to make." And I think everyone thought that at that time. Well, it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. EMI, I was uh. very close with. I'd taken a bunch of people down to see Tina. She was scrape money together to hire Hammersmith Odeon. I don't know what it's called now, but you remember the Odeon, I'm sure. The Apollo. Put, a, put on uh, almost like a show for record companies to see. And, and Tina, I've always been like the biggest fan. Then, of course, she had this amazing, successful comeback record. And I was off to south of France, a place called La Riole, to put together what became ultimately the 87 album. And EMI, uh, all the, the execs I knew there said, you know, if you come up with anything for Tina, Tina's follow-up, we need some songs. So that was the birth of that idea. It was originally for Tina Turner. 
Then right. David Geffen heard it and said, we're keeping this, you know. That was our second number one, but we were there for like two minutes and we had to move out. But it, it was those, it was that those sort of eight on the bass and the chorus arpeggio. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's got that riff, which became one of the great 80s tropes, which is that ba da ding <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the chime. Yeah. yeah. It's actually, it was featured before. I think John and I came up with ideas for that to make pre-choruses, you know, or bridges a little more in. Well, the Beatles, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was going back like to an hour ago, where I learned Tamla Motown from, which I adore George Harrison for, was doing Smokey Robinson the Miracles, You Really Got a Hold on Me. I just thought it was the greatest fucking song. I ultimately met Smokey and, and uh, he took me to Kareem Ab Abdul-Jabbar's house house in Hawaii where it's entirely designed for a guy who's like 10 foot tall you need a ladder to get on the fucking toilets it was a <laughs> feet swinging you know I suppose you think this is funny Kareem you know <laughs> but uh but yeah is this love was uh it was well, interesting for me because I I would write a lot of songs similar structure to here I go again which is the like quiet intro reflective intro and then I'd go fuck I've got to bring the band in and that became like a very identified structure for a white snake song but yeah but yeah, even the, after uh, even after that grunge acts did it all the time i mean nirvana all those acts took that you know uh, guns and roses took that idea of yeah. the quiet yeah and then going really huge like that you've got this massive voice but you've had a few problems with your voice over the years is, how does that work for you psychologically and i mean those must have been those must have been awful oh, times for you fuck are you kidding i'm a romantic realist the you know i developed this awful sinus infection this was in 85, I think, end of 85. I'd been doing guide vocals for the band up in uh, Vancouver. Ainsley Dunbar on the drums, Neil Murray on bass, remarkable John Sykes on guitar. And I'm, you know, you'll hear on the uh, box sets we do, I'm firing on all six doing guide vocals while to keep the band and shouting, bridge, solo, you know. And then when it came to my part to do it, I'm completely nasal and singing completely under the note. And I, I couldn't work it out. I saw two specialists in Vancouver. Both said, oh, you've just got a cold. Go back to L.A. I was living at the Mondrian Hotel at the time. And just get some sun on your chest, let it dry out. So, okay, fine. Then I go back and it's exactly the same. It's just awful. So Howard Kaufman, another God rest his soul, uh, my manager, he sent me to Dr. Edward Cantor, an amazing Beverly Hills oh, ENT. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, who said, it's the worst sinus infection I've seen. And it had started to go down from born with a deviated septum, you know, and it had started to go down onto my cords had we not caught it that would have been it but even after the surgery he said there's a 50 50 chance that you're not going to be able to sing in the, the style that you fashioned which was of course even though i could have been a writer for people a producer for people performing telling my stories out there that's it's like oxygen to me it's entirely natural for me to do that so to be denied that was just a horrifying concept and then i get another octave and change out of it it was amazing first song i did for the 87 record after all of this horror was the still of the night i did two passes on it and that's it <laughs> uh, that actually uh, that that vocal is so high and intense and i, I remember it actually used to I, it used to kind of almost hurt listening to you do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a whole body thing. It's the whole, yeah. you know, pulling it up. It's, yeah, it's a whole physical thing. I've always written challenging songs for myself. And of course, as you get older, it becomes slightly more challenging. <laughs> who, was, who was the guy who first, who was the guy really who invented all that Thai falsetto rock? I mean, I suppose it was Ian Gillen, wasn't it really? I mean, is that... Is he no, the... no, he got it from Edgar Winter. I mean, uh, oh, wow, I don't know, really? but that's, I was more familiar with Edgar Winter's scream. But you got to remember, one of my favorite songs actually guy uh worked on the song with me was lorraine ellison stay with me baby oh, yes uh and she wails like a mofo on it i mean terry reed god bless him did a version what was it like though i think lots of people who listen to this were just are really into the idea of the lifestyle of being a rock star you were one properly decent rock star i mean how was it in the pomp of white snake for you what was it did you did yeah. you ever get you played hard i guess it was Caligula in Wonderland, Caligula in Disneyland, <laughs> you know. 
It was, yeah, yeah. It's like, that's why it's hard for me to see anything other than Spinal Tap, which is perfectly true. I was having brunch at the, in the Polo Lounge, as I'm sure you guys are, uh, know, at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and Rob Reiner's in the next booth selling the Spinal Tap idea to a bunch of money guys. I kept turning around and fucking grinning at him, you know, because I look like what I am. I don't look like a fucking gynecologist, you know. <laughs> so and I'm with some Beverly Hills socialite. If you were but, my um, wife's gynecologist. I would be worried. <laughs> <laughs> but it was extraordinary. And it was really hard for me to see a lot of 80s bands perpetuating all the stories that they heard. You know, it's like Zeppelin had a very druggy aura. And it's like Jimmy would say, if we were fucked up all the time, we couldn't have made that music. Yeah. And that's absolutely true. So, and we, you know, Purple was surrounded in uh, South London bodyguards, you know. And so I would see these, a lot of these 80s bands using the bully boys to go and beat somebody up that they thought was looking at them wrong. It was just an abuse of this you know, decadent time. And we were all selling records arse over tit, you know. But it was interesting for me to be an observer and that been there, done that, you know, sniffed it, whatever. You know, I realized that if I wanted to maintain, I didn't anticipate this. I would have lost fucking money at my 30th birthday if I thought I'd be still doing this in ripe old 69. But uh, there's still an audience for it. People come to me as opposed to me making calls. It's an amazing scenario. But... I try to stay in shape, stay in fit. I don't want to walk on stage and and have love handles at the ready, you know, and sing Slide It In to some sexy babe in the front. <laughs> <laughs> You are magnificently preserved, it must be said, David. I would say. Bless your heart. Thank you so very much. <laughs> but it is, but it, is, it is possible, isn't it, to keep this going? I don't, it's fucking amazing. Well, Jagger's different. You know, Roger Daltrey's fucking hats off, man, you know. I think Roger's had some throat issues or whatever, but him and Peter, who's my favourite, you know, Guy and I would talk about this. I got a clip of you doing your best Townsend in that fucking video. Did you pick up on that? I did, You're yes, doing I your did big that. fucking yeah. superb, you know, I look over you and go, come on, you know, and you do a Townsend jump. Darren's in this club too, David. We're, we are all Townsend oh. boys here. I think it's Arnold Lane, isn't it? Or Emily Play. And, uh, oh, with, you do with, that? With it's also full of secrets. Oh, kick ass. Oh, actually, at one point, I break into 515. And then uh, oh, in, in the piano yeah. fellow and in see Emily Play, I just play the real me. Like, fuck we, we've not told Pete in case he wants to go after the publishing because it might, you yeah. know, it might change his life. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the same room with him. Yeah. No, what, what um... I love about what I love about you though is is in 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 your genre, you know, a lot of people think commitment was at certain at some point would be to go down that whole drug thing and and to live the life of what they perceive to be the great rock star. But your commitment is is different. There's an element of show business in what you do, but it's yeah. it's work. You're committed totally to the music, but you've never gone down that route of losing yourself. No, no. Uh, in fact, I stepped away from it from uh, after that 87, 90. It was three, over three years of just an express train that was... You know, I, I got married with what the hell? He chose to ignore alarm bells. I had to stop and I'd finished after the Slip of the Tongue World Tour in 1990. I had to stop to get perspective. It was just, I had no time to reflect on, am I happy? You know, yes, I was extraordinarily successful, but I, I had no time to go, am I happy? It was just working. I, I read a lot of uh, of books, you know, early Beatles stuff, and the timetable of shit they were doing every yeah. day, yeah, you yeah. know, was just, I've all sat in a fucking van that's, you know, Mal Evans, God rest his souls, driving down foggy, pissy, no, no services, you know, to eat stop and eat something, drinking whiskey and laying on each other to keep warm. That's right, you know, yeah. That was, yeah. give me the fucking starship anytime, love, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love the Craig that Brown book. The new Craig Brown yeah. book is yeah. great. One, two, Which three, Which one four. is that one? One, two, three, four. It's cool. Oh, I'll check that out. What is it? One, two, three? One, two, one, three, two, three four. four. 
Craig yeah, Brown. Yeah, I'll check that really out. Good. Yeah, yeah. I'm currently reading about Claridge's. <laughs> <laughs> I miss Claridge so fucking much. Talking of Claridge, it brings up you're, you're, one thing I always remember about you, David. Right, which to me is is true star quality. It's like I remember when we when we were staying in LA, we we're staying in I can't remember which what hotel it was. Bellage. We we're at the Bellage. It's now the London. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But we'd been there for two or three anyway. days, right? And you knew yeah. every member of staff's name, every girl on the deck, yeah, yeah. every doorman. Every I thought that to me was so. It was ah, oh, you know, Jackie, how nice are you looking? Lovely this afternoon. Oh, Jasper, open the door. If you were, that's, yeah, yeah. That to me, is the mark of a star. It's just being human, really. Yeah. It's uh, it's yeah. special. David Bowie had the same quality, and everyone says yeah. that. Oh, David yeah. was a doll. David was a doll. You know, I met him in his Ziggy days. It, he had a one-piece pink chiffon jumpsuit with a slight flare at the knee. He looked like fucking Vishnu when he came out of the bathroom. I'm going, holy shit. And that magnificent plume. In those days, I'd wear like all of those Navajo big silver honky uh, rings. And I'm sort of caught up in this absolute vision. And we shake hands and all the rings kind of crackle. You know, and he goes, fucking hell, I thought I broke your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Man, lovely, lovely, David. We, we might let you go now, David. Is that all right? Champion, yeah. Super to meet you, Gary. Absolutely lovely. I'm delighted that your friendship is lasting and that you're actually doing something together. When are you uh, back in England? A guy when... who I... Oh, fuck. I don't know. This I was talking to Jimmy two weeks ago, Michael, something... And I said, what I think will be amazing for the Coverdell Page anniversary album, which I think is 23, is because we can't travel and there's no crystal ball to say when this is going to be safe, Jimmy's holed up in his country pile. He's not coming into London. So I said, I think you should do your mix with your engineer of your choice, yeah, yeah. the Page mix, and I'll do the Coverdale mix over here, as well as the original, mm. you know, just remastered. I think the fans would fucking adore it. Yeah, so I still idea. have to sweet talk him into that. You know, and, and different perspectives, you know, because it's a cracking record, and, uh, and and we have it now. Well, I'd love to see you down at the O2. Yeah. Oh, fuck. We sold it out, Gary. My oh, first time ever. Me. I'd never been there. I haven't even been there. I was so excited. Yeah. You know, as great as success as we had, I couldn't wait to get to 2020. For fuck's sake. You know, but well, uh, I was going to use this and 21 to uh, to do my appreciation and gratitude for a 50 year career tour. You know, I hope to be able to do that. What's obvious is your enthusiasm is still there and it's inspiring to oh, talk God. to you. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I've got to go and finish off a couple of Christmas songs right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, I'm David. dreaming of a white snake Christmas. Thank you, Gary. Lovely to meet you. Guido, uh, stay safe uh, and well, gentlemen. Uh, lovely to see you, David. Love you dearly. Uh, lots of love. And you too, lots babe. Love. That's it for this week's episode of Rock on Tours. Thank you to David and thank you for listening. We're back next week with another superstar guest on the show. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Don't forget to leave a review. And we'll see you next week. See you next week. Thank you.